everyone. Today we've got uh, Brendan from the Bloop Museum over in Baltimore, on the other side of the world there in the United States. <laughs> so um, yeah, Brendan, I guess, uh, do you want to start by just telling us a bit about yourself and about your museum? Sure. Uh, I'm Brendan and I have a museum. No, um, I, uh, <laughs> I, uh, I've always had dreams about getting people together with some sort of electronic entertainment type thing uh, throughout my life. And uh, I did it a little bit with MAGFest uh, in the early aughts to around 2011, 2012, uh, something like that with MAGFest. So uh, you know, I thought maybe running a, a game convention or, you know, it's a, it's not a convention, it's a festival, if you ask mm -hmm. MAGFest, uh, you know, but, um, and, uh, you know, back, back, way back in the day, I had a, the equivalent of a lemonade stand, but there was a Nintendo and a Sega Master System okay. on the table instead of uh, lemonade, and you mm. would pay a quarter and you could play some games for a while. Uh, <laughs> yeah, right. stuff like that. Um, yeah, and, uh but I, I've also had a passion for education mm. uh, for a while. So um, anyway, eventually through a large set of, you know, collecting slash hoarding uh, and uh, also, you know, like my connections that I've made throughout the years and whatever, I mm. uh, met a guy that runs a fairly serious uh, computer museum here in Baltimore and decided that I would join up with him and try to supplement his music in, or his music, his museum mm. in any way I could find and, you know, build some fun things for him and also kind of insert a little bit of uh, autism into his museum. Like uh, basically uh, collecting, uh, kind of connecting the dots yeah. of, you know, like so many things in the computer world are so interconnected, which I'm sure mm. everyone watching this uh knows oh, yeah. but you know like how they're connected and in what ways they're connected and uh you know that sort of thing is always uh very fascinating to me and i feel like i have the ability to sort of communicate and uh convey that to people so i love uh you know connecting dots around the museum and walking around and being like this thing is related to that thing is related to this thing whatever and i think people appreciate that in the tour so um Anyway, those are some of my passions. Uh, I'm also a video game composer by trade. Uh, yeah, everything so I do at Blue is... And yeah. so would you call yourself a musician, a music producer? Like, how do you, I guess it's hard to put a definition on it. But yeah. I, so, so, I mean, I do it all myself. So it could be any of those. Um, you know, I write game soundtracks. I do uh, music tributes. Uh, I produce, I compose. I do covers, I do originals, you know, like it's yeah. just kind of, it's a crapshoot. I, you know, whatever. Um, mm. So, um, you know, I definitely have a little bit of, you know, an eye or I guess you should say an ear mm. for, you know, like uh, interesting. That's why the museum is called Bloop is because I like things that go bleep bloop. Yeah. Uh, you know, but also because it could stand for what ben Brendan's library of obscure obsolete peripherals or, you know, something mm. Uh, like that. So, um, you know, we, I, I try to play on all of those things and, uh, you know, Im imbue a little bit of uh, media, video and audio into the museum and make things fun. Um, so it's a fun place where you can, you know, play around with games, AV gear, old gadgets, uh, any computer from any era. Yeah. Um, and, you know, like my music is in the gift shop. Yeah. <laughs> so you, you would have the machines turned on, yeah? Like you'd have things playable or usable is the idea? So um, you'll, you'll notice, I mean, like around me, nothing is turned on. I could even, you know, kind of like just rotate and be like, oh, hey, look, it's rows and rows of computer stuff. Um, and usually, uh, so about 90% of the things in the museum work and turn on, mm. um, at least that are on the show floor. Yeah. Um, and uh, we don't usually just turn them all on unless we're having like an open house or, you know, mm -hmm. some sort of uh, party or event or something like that. But mm -hmm. uh, but we will turn them on for anyone that wants to see like, you know, so if a, if a small tour group comes in and they're like, oh, you know, I fell in love with computers at the Commodore 64, then we just mm -hmm. go right over to the Commodores and start turning stuff on, you know, like. Yeah. Um, I think we're similar here. Like, I mean, you can see that I've got yeah. all of this 
devices behind me and none of these are really plugged in or, or you know, operational. Um, just because, yeah, I mean, you, you get so many of these old things and there's a lot of labor involved, I think, in, in fixing them up and getting them in a working state. So you can't have everything yeah. all the time, you know, but yeah, we do, do yeah. try to have, you know, a representative sample, I think, of, of things going. Yeah, that and the electricity bill would be pretty high if everything were on all the time. So, uh, yeah. you know, that's another reason to, you know, like just turn things on when people ask. Um, we've actually but, uh, we've been really lucky here that um, a, a local electricity company called Red Energy has uh, given us some sponsorship. And so oh, cool. we yeah. are getting power from those guys. So um, give a shout out to them. So uh, Oh, that's fantastic. Yeah, yeah, we're really lucky with that because uh, when I when I started here last year, we were really, you know, struggling. Um, we didn't even have hot water, <laughs> you know, and um, that's that's the thing. Like it comes so far. It's managing the physical space that can be really tricky with these kind of things. You know, it's just you might have these these wonderful machines, but then it's like, do you have enough tables to put them on or enough shelves or things like that? You know, so. Yeah. Lots of logistics to be considered. Mm. For sure. Where you're talking about with, with music. So are you are you kind of uh, do, doing a chip tune like thing? So where you're writing music to go mm -hmm. on a console or something and then it will actually play on the original console? Is that your? Yeah. Uh, I'm I'm sp specifically focused on authenticity. Yeah. Um. You know, I don't write in any sort of DAW. Uh, I don't use any sort of plugins. Uh, I'm not. I don't. Uh, I think there there's sort of a, a battle uh, between authentic chip tuners and DAW chip tuners or whatever. I'm not interested in the battle. I think that people uh, writing chip tune inspired music in DAWs is. I think that's very cool. Um, and you know, like there are certainly some amazing plugins, like the, uh, the plug guys are, are doing chip synth and, you know, that sort of a thing. And they actually reverse engineer the chips to come up with, uh, psych uh psycho accurate, uh, plugins. Uh, you know, well, there's a, so there's a term that maybe you've heard, maybe you haven't called fake bit, uh, mm -hmm. which is a pun on eight bit, uh, but it being fake, obviously that's why they're calling it fake bit. Yeah. Um, and uh, and it's not a dig. It's not it's not an insult. Uh, mm. It's just meant as you know, like an explanation of you know, like well, it sounds chip tune, but it's not really, and whatever. And I wish more people would um, adopt and own the term because I think it's actually kind of uh, you know um, affectionate <laughs> towards mm. towards that style of music. Um, the uh, the, the weird exceptions that I've also seen is on the Amiga, for example, uh, you have chip memory, you know, the uh, the lower half of uh, the memory. Well, it might be more than half, but, you know, like the first 512K, which mm. would be like, you know, the uh, it, on a DOS machine, that would be your conventional memory, right? Um, the Amiga has chip memory, which is the lowest end of the memory that all of the chips can access. Okay. Um, and, uh, and if it fits in chip memory, even though the Amiga is a sample playback machine, mm. uh, then they call, sometimes they call it a chip tune and it could be literally, you know, music with recorded samples and it sounds normal and even speech samples and whatever. But uh, at, at some point, someone called that a chip tune just because it fits in chip memory. Uh, so that's like the one exception that I've heard that yeah. I'll, mm -hmm. I'll kind of let it slide. But uh, um, so, so one, Actually, with 4-op synthesis, I don't know if you've ever listened to Fallen's time tracks, but it turns out that a Sega Genesis can actually do a realistic sounding, uh, you know, like electric guitar uh, yeah. sample. Uh, listen to some Thunder Force 4, um, if you haven't listened to that. Uh, you know, Thunder Force 4 and time tracks are probably my top two, like, you can, okay. you can get real guitar sounds out of a Mega Drive. So that's not um, sampled, that's generative, is what you're saying? Those are generated FM, and okay, it's only yeah. four up. It's not yeah. it's not complicated FM, hmm. it's it's basic FM. Um, and uh, so I think once you get into the more complicated FM and the more complicated chips, it's not just one chip that's making hmm. the sound. It's more okay. like a collection of chips. Yeah. Uh, you know, working together, that sort of a thing. So I still like to say a chip making a tune is chip tune. Okay. Yeah. Uh, you know, and, uh, and it should be simple or basic, you know, it should be a chip that's only able to do, you know, 
a maximum of like, I don't know, 10 channels or something like that. Usually yeah. it's three for the PSGs or something, uh, you know, and like six ish or something for the basic FM chips. Um, you know, but like, uh, but as soon as you get into like, you know, is, is the DX seven chip tune? Well, mm. kinda it's six op and you've got a lot of polyphony. Um, and you know, like, yeah, okay. Uh, but like another example is someone's like, oh, so the Sega Genesis or, or let's even do the NES, right? There's no FM. Yeah. Um, the NES barely has, uh, you know, like it sort of has DAC stuff, mm. but people will enable all of the expansion sound chips like that you had on the Famicom, for example. Um, and they'll, uh, they'll use like the, the wave channels on these expansion chips to like pump out you know, like long speech samples mm. in, in perfect quality and whatever. And it's like, is it chiptune? Well, it is coming out of the original hardware, but I yeah. think you've kind of departed from the idea of chiptune. So, um, you know, like, and then there's the, the other battle is there's a chiptune scene, you know, mm. like the, the group of people that are all writing stuff on this old hardware and people that are writing uh, you know, chiptune inspired or chiptune, uh, you know, like related things in a DAW with a plug-in and it's not authentic at all mm. are still a part of the chiptune scene. Yeah. You know, um, so, yeah, I, I think it's a very complicated term and the easiest thing to do is to better, uh, better describe your work, more specifically describe your work. Like, you know, this is a Mega Drive chiptune. Uh, you know, or something like that, instead of, you know, saying, oh, is it chiptune because they did this, this or that? Why not just des describe this, this and that and say, oh, you know, this person wrote this with a Nintendo and a Famicom expansion, you know, like, OK, done, you know. Um, but but usually, you know, like if I want to just encompass my stuff uh, often to museum patrons or whatever, I just have to tell them I write 8-bit music because they still don't know you know, the word chip tune at all. Um, you know, so that's another problem that you run into as, as a game composer or a chip tune mm. mus musician. Uh, yeah. What about a music box? <laughs> I mean, again, the like, music box doesn't have a chip. It wasn't mm. engineered, you know, like it, you should really hyper focus on, you know, it's a sound chip Yeah. and it makes a tune, uh, you know, and uh, and I think once you once you kind of get into that sort of, you know, like and I'm not trying to exclude people from a chiptune scene by saying oh, that. No, 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 I'm not trying to yeah, I'm not trying to push you on this, but just that yeah, I like No, I understand. Working out um, the the limits of what you know, yeah, it's, ideas. it's like, not to do like with computer music that creates music, yeah, you know, in in a simplistic fashion. Like is that different to a generative AI or something like, like, yeah, I guess, um, you know, I mean, you could say this is, you know, this is music that was procedurally generated, mm. right? You can say this is AI music, Yeah, uh, getting, getting AIs to write chiptunes, uh, famous last words so far has not been very successful. Yeah. Uh, it doesn't sound very realistic. Um, but getting AIs to write regular music, even electronic music or, you know, something that sounds like guitars or whatever mm. has been very successful because they're just taking a recording of a guitar and imitating yeah. it. Right. So understanding how I source my music is mm. uh, a part of understanding my music education, which is to say there is none. Mm. Um, I don't, I didn't go to school for music. Um, and I actually can't meet, read a musical staff. I cannot read guitar tabs. Uh, I can't read anything but tracker music. So if you're familiar with mod files, yeah. uh, you know, like that is how I got my start was writing mods. Mm. Um, and, uh, you know, I did take in, you know, like seventh grade or whatever. I took the general music class that where they teach you history and, you know, how to play a Yamaha recorder and whatever. And, you know, like, uh, how to tap out notes on a piano and how to read a staff. Uh, but I'm not using any of that to write chip tunes. Uh, you know, it's really just me and, you know, the equivalent of a mod tracker or whatever. Mm. Uh, and, you know, in, for example, in Famba tracker, you actually have a pull down menu where you can say, give me an NSF file mm. that you can then throw on a flash cartridge and put in a real Nintendo. 
so, so uh, there's another noodle around a bit and then play it and listen to it and then iterate on that yeah or? Uh, yeah, I mean, I grew up in a musical family and I listen to music all the time. So I just listen to the music and I was like, does it sound good? Yes. All right. Let's the, let's go on to the next part. Um, yeah. You know, uh, doing covers and tributes uh, certainly has helped me uh, because studying other people's music structure is a great way to learn how to do music structure on your own. Mm. Um, but, uh, you know, I just uh, I just write stuff. And if it sounds good or uh, another thing is, is like sometimes the music's not for me. Right. It's for a client. Uh, so, you know, I'll just, uh, ask the client if this is what they want, you know, and if it, if it isn't, it's back to the drawing board, uh, you know, and if it is, then great, you know, pay me. <laughs> you know? Yeah, I always think it's interesting how much, like, that there's actually a really big crossover between like computer people and music people and that it mm -hmm. doesn't, I don't think that it really gets, um, the sort of attention that it should I, I i kind of feel like that maybe there was this conspiracy back in like the 80s to make people think computers aren't cool you know like i think that you know there was some point where it's like everyone was having fun with them and then all these guys in suits were like oh we, you know, we got to convince people that computers are serious you know and so we can make money off them because it's like so many people i think have these these wonderful memories of being kids and playing with computers you know that it was like a, a play thing that you could make a game you could make a song you could just do whatever you wanted and yeah as adults you get a bit scared of doing that you know and you're like oh you know i can only use this to do my emails or something and like yeah, you get less creative so much creative potential in computer and you think you know like that there are you know rhythm games and stuff i mean we had the whole guitar hero thing you know maybe 15 years ago where it was like suddenly and mm -hmm. it was sort of looked down on but then it's like i mean i don't know how to play a guitar you know but like to me playing guitar hero feels like i'm playing guitar you know in the same way i don't know how to like beat somebody up you know but i can play like street fighter 2 with a joystick you know i don't go and punch the screen and say oh well, it's nothing like real fighting you know like that's it's a game but it captures mm -hmm. the feeling of that thing you know and that you have these um you know sort of plastic instruments or something or something that um i was showing you you know off off the recording earlier you know it's like um with the you know interact oh yeah the interactor the vibration yeah. device you know where then I've, I've wired it into the um playstation controller and then i've been playing you know rhythm games like rares or there's another one called aero where it's you know that the action is happening in time with music and the music is such a big part of that you couldn't have that game without music being in it it wouldn't you know it wouldn't be anywhere near as fun and so it's like and, and even you know, i've got to think that the classical music guys they were all obviously around before computers but you know like surely they would have all been into computers if they weren't around now like whoever invented the piano has to have been a massive geek right like how could you possibly invent and build the piano you know without having like an it mindset because you've got to think about the mathematical relationships the mechanical relationships the ergonomics all of these things you know and then of course the piano became the player piano which was like a mm -hmm. punch card and then that's become computer memory and is then so yeah i just think that like and so much music you know like i was saying is, is produced on computers so many yeah and and you know i, I would love it if we could kind of do a music event here one day but i don't know how we would be able to promote it and kind of you know that it's like how do you convince kind of the normies that like oh we've got this room full of computers like you know but it's actually really cool like we're all in here playing music and stuff you know let's have a rave like i'll you know, connect you with some people you might already know them mm. uh you know you're you're near um uh chris or his uh, his music name is Citrix um i did try to get in touch with him. I think he was a bit area. busy last year so i might try to to contact him again yeah because we were trying to get him for an he event. has a hell of a schedule he's <laughs> in another state so it's like it's that thing where we're both in australia but it's actually like you know um like 500 miles apart so you know that there is a bit of a, a trans transport issue there and, yeah uh, um but uh you know like i think that there is there's at least a small chip scene there and they could probably you know, gather to the uh, to, together at the museum or something like that, and yeah. you know, put something on. I think you'd be able to pull it off. Yeah, and and cool. they're they're the kinds of people that would be able to get you know just people that are into music and mm. you know reach a crowd that uh, you know. I think that um, 
I, I think that the the stigma of you know like computers being for business and mm. you know that sort of a thing exists a little bit less here. Um, you know, but uh, but I definitely still see uh, that sort of a you know prejudice or whatever you want to call it. You know, mm. like uh, attached to computers as serious things, and you know that's actually one of the reasons that I run Bloop. Uh, is because I want to sh uh, show people that, you know, like uh, computers and technology and whatever are, you know, like surrounding you in your daily life. And there's a nerdy side to it and a fun side to it. And you can connect the two in, you know, like a multitude of ways, um, you know, like, and I, I think that uh, I don't think it's hard to get people to make that connection. I think that you just kind of need to impress it upon them. Uh, and you know, uh, people start to get it. Yeah, because I, I'm I, I know that like I always try to do a lot of fun stuff for my kids with computers, you know. And um, like when my son turned three, you know, he had a, a birthday cake, and um, one of my wife's cousins made it that was uh, like a construction site, you know. So it had this sort of mm. building made of cake, and then a toy truck on it, and then I built um, a, a Lego crane, and then stuck a little Arduino in, in a server so that it could move around and lift up and down oh, cool. yeah. and then built the frame out of Duplo so that, you know, it was this kind of very kiddie looking thing, but then it had, you know, just in it. So the whole day, like the crane was turning around and Spider-Man was going up and down on the, the string of the crane, you know, and, and just little things like that, or you, you build odd little toys or things, or, you know, try, try to stick some of these things in because, yeah, I think again, that that, that playful side of it, maybe people don't see enough, you know, or, um, and yeah, that's yeah. what I really like about this place is that it gives us a bit of a space. Like I don't have any room or money for a computer collection at home. I've got my original yeah. Sega Mega Drive and that's it, you know, just because I've got it in a box from when I was a kid, but I don't have all of this. Same. All of this stuff is here, you know, and I can just go in and th there's no real gatekeepers on it. You know, that like, I'm not really a qualified computer engineer, but you know, we just had all of these machines sitting in boxes. Nobody was using them. So you take them out and fix them up and, you know, start make a little video of it. And then it's like, you know, people were like saying, oh, you're the Auric expert. And it's like, well, I don't know anything about the Auric, but I'm the only person that, you know, bothered to switch it on and figure it out and then make a video of it. So, yeah, you know, we're sort of getting a few new people in that, you know, are bringing new skills and that kind of stuff. And yeah, I think it's really good that you, you then start to meet people through these sort of institutions. And I guess that you'd find that with your museum there is that yep. you, you'll get someone in and then they'll say, oh, I used to work with this or I had one when I was a kid. And then sometimes you'll get someone who, you know, is really young and doesn't know anything about it, but then they will have a different perspective on it or a new idea. Yeah. So, well, and uh, I think you'd mentioned that you'd heard of VCF. Mm. Um, so, you know, the Vintage Computer Federation uh, many of the guys that run that are here on the East Coast. Okay. Uh, so, you know, like we're within a couple hours of, uh, you know, those those people and the VCF East event that runs in Wall, New Jersey is, you know, like three hours up the road. Mm. Um, and uh, uh, Bob's Museum is a part of the Federation. Um, it's not, you know, a, a like we, we run... I, I don't know. It's it's sort of a loosely organized, uh, you know, organization. They do their own things for their own federation and whatever. But, uh, you know, like, I think uh, Bob, the guy that is the, the VP of this facility and runs his museum, he's, uh, uh, you know, he's helped out with their website and uh, several other things. Um, so, you know, like, uh, we, we all help each other over here. And I think the VCF events, at least in the States, are... You know, a very good way to meet other nerds that, uh, you know, they've they've actually, uh, gosh, they've been going for at least, you know, a decade or two here. And uh, the the scene is bursting at the seams at this point. Mm. Um, That's great. The, you know, like uh, I went to VCF Midwest, which uh, is Vintage Computer Festival, not Federation. And the Midwest event is not. Uh, a part of the the federation, so that adds extra confusion if you this is your first time hearing about it. Uh, but um, but VCF Midwest uh, this year was absolutely insane. It was just a couple months ago, and uh, the hotel is just packed. 
Um, so uh, that's that's yet another you know vintage computer event and whatever we'll do repair weekends here where you know there's regularly 50 to 80 people uh running through the place on a saturday um people you know fixing up their own project and if they come without a project we can plop one in front of them mm. uh you know that sort of a thing so that's that's often fun yeah um we'll do swap meets we'll do other stuff um here the you know i mean i'm sitting i'm actually sitting in a japan exhibit and i should maybe spin around a little bit so that you okay. can see uh, maybe I should be off to the side so that you can yeah. kind of, you know, whatever. But, um, and there's a Japanese game consoles. Maybe mm. if I, uh, if I get over onto one side, you can, yeah, those oh, are yeah. fun too. But, uh, so that, uh, that mega drive actually does say mega drive for what it's worth. <laughs> uh, un unlike my Genesis in the other yeah. room that I showed you, but, uh, you know, um, so uh, one other thing that I'm, I'm hoping that we can do a little bit more of as time goes on is uh, get people through here for game nights or movie nights or, mm. you know, that sort of a thing. Um, and I, I think that would work well for you if you haven't already tried it. Yeah, um, I think that you, know, you guys maybe... are where we'd like to be in terms of, you know, the number of people and that sort of thing. And, and I think that I think there are people out there in sydney in australia mm -hmm. that would be interested that don't know about us yet and so i think we've still got to try to you know build up a bit of like uh public awareness and that sort of stuff because i think that there's so many people that would like to be here but they don't know that it's here or you know so yeah sure yeah i, I guess that's you know how, how you build that up so um that that's our big sort of challenge you know i mean i guess we've got a lot of challenges yeah. one is just keeping you know keeping the 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 doors open Keeping the heat on and the yeah for sure the heat's on <laughs> yeah well and thanks to red right uh you know like uh so that's probably helpful of course right now you're not really worried about the heat being on as much as we are because we're about to enter winter no we're, we're coming uh, but, into yeah. summer so um yeah yeah you know, this, this building is very good. uninsulated so it's it's going to be whatever the ambient temperature is this one's <laughs> always I'm gonna start going way up yeah, yeah. um well, I will say this, uh, as far as, uh, you know, something that we would love to do and we'd love to share with you. And uh, you said this is going up onto YouTube. So anyone yep. that is watching this video, um, Bloop is uh, the, the game collection at Bloop. I maintain a game collection of roughly mm. 12,000 games. Um, and uh, I would love to trade American games with anyone uh, outside of the country so that we can build up a better awareness mm. of, you know, the world outside of, you know, like, I think that, uh, you know, a lot of people in the States, uh, just never leave the States, never think about the world outside of the States mm. and whatever. We've got a reputation for that. Right. Uh, but, um, but there are a lot of people that, uh, even if they're not thinking about the States or outside of the States, they want to think about, uh, other places, or they're curious about it, whatever. So uh, you were showing me a Dick Smith Wizard, yeah, just a minute ago. I can show you mine. Oh, there you go. So there's uh there's you ours. We don't have nearly now, as cool, so that's though. good. Yeah. So, um, but uh, you know, um, I the the point is is that you know, like we we throw international stuff out on display. Mm. Um, and so I'd love to trade that with you and anyone else that, you know, if you have some, and you yeah. might think, oh, you know, I can't possibly give a museum something that is museum worthy or whatever. Mm. And I don't care about that. I want your common and oh, you yeah. know, like, uh, even, even stuff that people consider uncollectible because where else am I going to get it? You know? <laughs> um, so, uh, you know, I'll put that call out while we're sitting here talking about it and, uh, I need to talk to you about some of the stuff that you showed me in the uh, yeah. uh, in the Aussie room uh, or the Aussie corner or whatever you want to, mm -hmm. you know, like the local computers mm. corner. Yeah, look, I, I just want to say thanks for thanks for your time. Um, sure, it's Ab probably absolutely. not not past your bedtime. It's probably past your dinner time now. So um... I had dinner before we started, so oh, uh, I, I I prepared myself. But that's uh, good to hear. Yeah, it's, it's it's barely about to become 9 p.m. I'll probably go and watch some uh, some anime with my partner or something like that. Yeah, cool. It was a pleasure talking to you. Um, no if anyone yeah. wants to find us, 
uh, we're just Bloop Museum, and yep. we're on the internet. Um, and uh, yeah, I'll put know, a link like, in the YouTube description so people can find it. Yeah, awesome. I'd love to connect with anyone that wants to connect with us. Thank you for reaching out to me. Oh, that's great. Yeah, uh, you know, it's fun. Yeah. Okay. Well, have a great day or a great night, I guess, in your case. And uh, look, we'll we'll definitely speak to you later. Okay. Yeah. Cool. Right. Great. I'll see you around then. See you later.